Welcome, welcome to those joining to our virtual door. We have people walking into our virtual door as we speak. So uh, just so we don't feel like we're talking to no one, even though we have a decent sized panel today, if those joining, you'll see two areas. One is a chat section, one is a Q&A. The Q&A section is only for profound questions. If you're not sure if it's a profound question, you can ask, is this question a profound enough question? That's a fair question in the Q&A. And the chat section we'll use more for comments and things like that. So I'd love to hear where people are tuning in from. A great way to know that we're not talking to a wall. So if you could just put in the chat area, just which state, the state, which country, got someone from Atlanta. And again, we'll give a few minutes, a minute or two for others to, uh, to join. Cary, North Carolina, Northern California, Chevron, beautiful. London, Jersey, New York. Okay, we, we're getting uh, international attention. Well, the whole world's the same at this point. So Jerusalem, Brooklyn, San Francisco, Israel, Florida, beautiful. So today's topic is called collateral damage. Uh, collateral damage is a scary topic for me to address and to touch on because in some ways, um, and we're talking about the collateral damage of addiction. So by talking about that, I'm acknowledging that there was some collateral damage from my own addiction. And what I tell a lot of people new to recovery, who I work with, is that the first process in recovery is realizing the way we've been hurt by others. And to really be able to name and acknowledge and own uh, the pain that was caused to us, whatever that pain was, often a pain in childhood, but sometimes not. And a lot of us don't recognize that we live in fear. A lot of us don't recognize that we've sustained ma major trauma or major pain or that our parents weren't 100% who we needed them to be. And there's work we need to do as adults to get some of the things they weren't able to give us. And that's kind of the first stage of recovery. And for those who are able to get through the first stage, the second stage of recovery is realizing the ways in which we've hurt other people. And that's often much, much tougher to, to get through. The, um, the guilt, the shame, um, especially in an environment like today where oftentimes someone does something wrong and the public shaming can be so quick and so ruthless, even if it's from something a long time ago, the guilt that someone, when recognizing the pain they caused someone else could be very real. I often share about my own story when my wife, then girlfriend, found out that I wasn't quite the person I, um, she thought I was, I would say, because of my porn habits and because of some other um, addictive habits related to other women. Uh, it caused her a lot of pain. And I, I didn't know I can hurt another human being that much. And it's one of the things that motivated me and propelled me into recovery. And one of, the, one of my main motivations today is I never want to hurt another person in that way, but that doesn't change the fact that those things are real. The damage is real. So today we have a panel of Miriam H. Uh, if some of you have, were on the panel. If, if anyone was on the panel, we did exit strategy um, with David Chaim. If anyone remembers that, if you were, just put a one in the box. I'm curious if anyone was in that one. David Chaim is the husband of Miriam H. So there are a couple of people on that panel as well. She'll be telling her story. Stephanie Pollock, I met her about a year ago. I think it was about a year, maybe a little bit over a year when you shared your story at a mic drop evening um, about losing your husband from opioid addiction. It was very powerful to, um, I'll never forget that night. The air conditioner wasn't working very well. It's a packed room, <laughs> about 80 or 90 people in a, in a small room and uh, your story was extremely, it moved me tremendously and it's one of the reasons I reached out to you today so that others can hear your story. And then um, my friend, my teacher, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, who's been on a couple of these panels as well, uh, to share some of his thoughts and insights because the, uh, like I said, the, 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 both sides of it are real, the pain we cause others and the pain we experience ourselves. So without talking too much about it, Stephanie, if you want to hop in and share a little bit of your own story. Hi, I'm Stephanie Pollack. Um... Coming up six years ago, my husband, Mati, died from a drug overdose, July 4th, 2014. And it started prior to our marriage. Um, it started from a 
from a surgery that he had as a result of a surgery that he had um, where the painkillers kicked into his life. Um, and then it followed with doctors prescribing him Suboxone as a long-term solution as opposed to weaning off of painkillers. Um, so when we were, you know, we had broke, we started dating in high school. Um, we broke up plenty of times throughout the course of those years. Um, but when we got back together for marriage and in the beginning of the marriage, he was more than functional because there was nothing wrong with him because he never experienced any withdrawal symptoms. There was any, there was nothing crazy going on because he was taking a Suboxone every moment of every time. And I really wasn't aware of what was going on. Um, I understood it as just being medicine for, as a result of the surgery. Um, we got married and although we had planned on waiting two years into marriage to start a family, God has other plans and seven months into marriage, um, I got pregnant and, but there was always this pattern every time we went to New York, cause we had moved down to Florida from Brooklyn after we got married and we would always go in for yuntiv for holidays and for weddings. And every time we would go, there would, there would, there would be this cycle of this roller coaster of emotions of, you know, depression, complete MIA in Brooklyn. And then we would come back to Florida and then there would be this roller coaster of emotions again. And me being this, like, you know, this, uh, how do you call it? Codependent, which I didn't know what that word was then. I was cheering him on and rooting him on. I'm like, come on, Mati, you are so capable. You are, you are such a leader. So many people depend on you, your work, everything you do, everything you've done is so amazing. You know, every single day, like get out of bed, get out of bed. There's so many people that are waiting for you. Look at who you are all the, every day, every day was so draining. But when I found out that I was pregnant, the, it, it went from being an emotional roller coaster to complete isolation where I didn't know that he had gone on full relapse mode from that point, from that news. And, um, you know, being alone all the time throughout the pregnancy was probably one of the most painful experiences. Um, I, you know, at first I, we moved to Florida. Part of our excuse was, you know, cause we, did not like living in Brooklyn. We didn't want to raise a family in Brooklyn, but it was also, we wanted to, I don't know, I got like he had demons he wanted to run away from. And I had my family where I wanted to detach from to start anew, you know, obviously unhealthy reasons, but. Um, they call it the geographic cure. The yes, exactly. Like they, like they talk about in the big book story there, there we, we went to, we went to Alaska for that. We went to Vancouver. We went to Chicago. We went many places, you know, um, but still, I had no idea why we were spontaneously jumping on a plane to go all the way to Alaska to go on a cruise for seven days. No idea. Like great spend quality time with him. There was no quality time because we were just on a different, we were just in different worlds apparently, but there was, you know, my pregnancy started, um, and as the time progressed, as the summer progressed, it was getting worse, and I didn't know. I just knew he was less and less there and available. Um, you know, saying he'll be home in a half hour, not showing up three hours later, phone not available, constantly calling people to get in touch with him. Like, my life just became so consumed and involved with, like, how to get in touch with Mutsi. When are you coming home? Yelling at him every second. I just, I was transforming into this hormonal monster, um, and I also Did you know had, anything about the drugs at this point? Not yet. Not until not I, yet. towards yeah. the end of my, my pregnancy, till the end of the pregnancy when, um, things were apparently getting bad and he sat me down. I was seven and a half months pregnant and he sat me down and he said that he had a problem and he's going away for 10 days. And when he comes back, like as if it'll be cured, like he was going to go into detox I didn't know what he was going away for. I didn't know what it was. Um, and I said, great, you do what you gotta do. I love you, I'm here for you. I'll be here when you get back. Um, he went into the other room and in our first apartment, the walls were so thin, you can literally hear everything. And I hear him on the phone with an insurance company and he's saying things like opiates and milligrams. And, and I, I'm starting to Google and I'm like, okay, this is, this is much worse than I thought it was. Still didn't know because 
I didn't, I still didn't understand. But more than that, it wasn't my problem. It was his problem that he needed to fix. But I was still going to be there at the end to like have my cape and make sure meals were ready and lunches were set. And I ended up, he went to, he went to detox for 10 days. They called me and they said that, you know, they really highly recommend that my husband go into a 30 day facility. And I said, that's really nice, but I'm about to have a baby soon. And I have Thanksgiving to make at the end of the month for my family. So he can't not be there. And my priorities were just like, what are other people going to think what's going on in my life? I can't, can't come up with a lie. I had to lie a week before because I went into New York for my best friend's wedding and Mutsi wasn't there, but he was in Europe. And that, you know, and then the lies just start and, the, and it just it dominoes in from one lie to another. And I told him that he had, he had to come home. He was, you know, he said he was going to follow whatever plan he was going to follow, going to, you know, meetings every day. And in the beginning, I was like on top of him. And he also told me what to look out for. If, he's, if I see him scratching all the time, slurring his words, dozing off, then I'll know that he's using. And he also admitted that all the money that was constantly depleted from our account was because of him and he used me as an excuse for my shopping habits. I'm like, there's only so much a person can buy at home goods and Bed Bath & Beyond. It's not hundreds of dollars a day. Um, but I didn't know and I believed him. I believed all of that. Um, that I like there was so much at fault of like what I was doing and I wasn't perfect. I know I wasn't. Um, um, in my ninth month, um, where I thought he was, you know, you know, done with whatever it is that he went into detox for, you know, he was going to meetings and we, you know, I share this in my mic drop that I would, we were supposed to go to Key West for Shabbos. And he said, you know, he'll be home at a certain time. He's going to be home at four so he can do the drive on Thursday. And it would be perfect and amazing. Another spontaneous, you know, trip, you know, after all this time of not spending time with each other. And he didn't show up until close to 11 o'clock at night. And we ended up checking into a local hotel in Hollywood Beach for Shabbos instead. And the next day he said he was going to a meeting and that he was going to be back by noon. And he didn't come home by noon. And I also got into this crazy sick pattern of constantly checking our bank account because I, my trust was already starting to, I was losing that trust in him. And I don't know what possessed me that day. And I went onto the bank account and I checked and there were close to $600 withdrawn from our bank account during the time he claimed he was at the meeting. And again, I was just waiting to attack. So all I was doing, like waiting to point fingers and waiting to attack waiting to say all the horrible things. And I did just that. When Shabbos started that night, um, I caught him red-handed and I just, you know, I, I pushed him down to a worthless nothing that he already felt. And when I felt good for, for like a quick minute, but then when he promised me he was never going to do it again and he didn't know how it happened and why it happened. And it was all so quick. P.S. The building next door is where his drug dealer lives. So he purposely planned this whole situation, but I didn't know that until afterwards. Um, you know, he promised it wasn't going to happen again. And I, and I so badly wanted to believe it because we're about to start a family and we were about to do all these things. And, you know, you know, his word meant so much to me still. Um, and, the next day happened and the same thing happened where he didn't stop and it just continued and it and it snowballed really bad really painfully and like i share my mic drop that was the first time i went on that carousel of insanity of doing the same thing expecting different results and i did that over and over and over again for months and what was that same thing you were doing believing that there was change that was going to happen when there was no change happening nothing changes if nothing changes and there was nothing changing on my end either. I was just becoming more, the only thing that was changing was my anger and my resentment and all these negative feelings and this tension of, and this disgust of like, who is this person? Who is this person that I'm married to? I don't know who you are anymore. It was, it was very hard. And this is the person I've known since I'm 15 years old. Um, a couple, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later, I have my son, we, I give birth to my son and um, 
again, you know, there was that abstinence and I talked, there's, you know, abstinence and sobriety are two different things. Walking on thin ice. Um, I've seen it. I, I saw it in my marriage with him. I have seen it in my own in a way. Um, you know, there is a huge difference between those two words. And it was six weeks, um, I was six weeks postpartum. And I also did, I also did the geographical, uh, you know, change of scenery thinking it would help. I would always run away to back to New York to my in-laws because they were a safe place for me because I was still hiding it all from everyone in my life. I was, no friends knew about it. My family had no idea what was going on. They had no clue, no one. I had no friends to talk to about it. Um, and I would run away to Brooklyn every single time something would happen. And um, I ended up there and my, you know, his father found out about Rabbi Kessler's first Jewish recovery Shabbaton. It was that first year. And he was like, go, just like, you know, Mati, go. And he's like, I'm only going to go if Stephanie is going to go. I need her support. I need her to be my cheerleader. And I'm like, of course, I'm your wife. I'm going to be there. Like, you go to all the shirim. You go to all, not shirim. You go to all the meetings. You go to all the speeches. I'll be there with oh. our baby. I flew back from New York. He promised he was going to pick me up. And again, there was that insanity of like, I waited at Miami airport in the heat with the newborn baby for about two hours because he kept missing the exit, so he claims, but it was just because he was so high that he kept missing everything. And again, that anger built up again. And the next day came, and like I shared my mic drop, I was trying to feed our son and I was crying and he was crying. And that was when I just hit my rock bottom of this is, uh, am I allowed to use bad language? No, I shouldn't use bad language. Like this is like, this use is- whatever the, language. They're not, this I, don't, is I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's bad language. I think there's powerful language. What is happening language. here? That like, what is going on in my life? Like my, I, I am causing so much distress and so much pain. Never mind. I don't even care about my own. I can mask it. I can shove it with food. I can do so many things, but this child isn't eating. Child isn't, his body is not functioning well. And as a result of me and his environment that he didn't choose, and like I say, that was the first time I finally chose something in my life and I chose my son. And I went on that Shabbaton. And again, I went thinking that it was just for him. And I ended up meeting a phenomenal group of other people, of spouses and loved ones. And they were like, oh, sweetie pie, come here. You know, like you can sit with us. That's pretty much what it felt like. And they were, they were gentle and they opened me up to are you feeling this? Are you feeling this? Like, can are I, these can your I symptoms? pause for one second? Can I pause for one second? You mentioned you kind of went quickly through the bottom, and I'm wondering if you sit in the bottom for a little bit. You said that you hit your rock bottom. What were the feelings? What were the emotions? What I was, was in my thoughts? rock bottom for a lot more than just that. Like, I was in the rock, my rock bottom even after. But I'm sorry, what was your but question? That, that moment when you hit it, what were the thoughts? What were the what were you telling yourself then? What changed? Right? Something snapped. It's like the back broke. What I was. What I shifted? Was, what, I, what was the new belief? Or the new realization. The new, the new belief was that I needed to make a change around me. I needed to, something needed to change because he deserved, my son David ne deserved something healthy in his life, deserved so, stability in some sort of way. I want to drill down. I didn't know how I was going to get You need there. to change something. I needed to change something for him. As opposed That's, to thinking your husband needed to change something. Right. Right now I couldn't, I, I had to focus on my son who wasn't getting anywhere. I couldn't put the focus on him yet. So I put so much shift. focus on, I put, I was putting, I was constantly putting focus. And even after that moment, I was putting focus. I mean, that whole weekend, I still put focus on him. Like, this is all about you. And as a result of me being there, I ended up gaining, you know, a wealth of knowledge and exposure to a whole language that, and, and, you know, community of people that I didn't know existed. But at that moment, I realized that I needed to make a change for David. It wasn't me You're personally. David, your son. David, my son. Okay, let's do this. Son. Let's let's pause here just for a minute because it sounds to me like you're about to segue into the solution and some of what you learned, which I want to get to in more of a panel discussion. But Miriam, I'd love to hear some of your your story as well, um, in terms of you know Stephanie spoke a lot about the the drug addiction. Uh, I believe your story is being the wife of a sex addict. Um, I'm sure there's some similarity, some difference, but I'd love to hear a little bit of your story before we open it up to uh, Rabbi Simon and the larger group. Stephanie, thanks so much. It's a, 
I encourage uh, those watching and listening to Google her name and watch her mic drop talk where she goes into some additional detail and the emotions are, um, you'll see some raw emotions, but I think it's important to understand that it's one of the, the, the main reasons I do these things is that I think we have to name things specifically in order to, to deal with it. And it's also, Stephanie, why I wanted to drill. What was the specific thought that you had? What was it that you said? Because when we name things in generalities, it gets very difficult to address something. When we can break it down into a specific and name it with a, with a word, it's often where the healing begins. So Miriam, welcome from Israel. Hey, how are you? First of all, great. thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, because usually I'm on the other side trying to support uh, women who are going through this, and now I, here I am coming forward and telling my whole story and that happened 26 years ago. It ain't easy, but I'll do my best because this is, a, you know, in, in, in Judaism, there's a concept of somebody who's doing tshuva. It's not the same person anymore. And thank God, David Chaim is not the same person. So I'm going to have to scratch my memory bank and do the best I can in order to support the women who are listening, the women, the spouses that are listening to this. So, um, David Chaim and I, I think I it's were, important that you say that although the panel ended up being two women um, who are talking about their, their spouses, there's, there's the reverse all the time. There are female addicts as well. It's not always the, the male addict when with I, the female codependent. I was very surprised when I came to meetings in, 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 and, and I saw a man. And I'm like, holy cow, <laughs> there's a change here. So, um, okay, so what happened to us? David Chaim and I, we, we were the cake on top of the wedding. We, we were the couple on top of the wedding cake. What we, were the perfect, we were the oh. perfect couple. I remember when Burt Reynolds was asked by Johnny Carson, I know I'm, it's dating me, what happened when you left Lonnie Anderson? He says, you know how heavy it was to be the couple on the wedding cake? It was, I had to perform constantly that everything was perfect, but yet it was not. And it was that because I did not understand the habit of flirting in the restaurant with waitress, flirting with your babysitters, uh, looking at porn and it's okay, L having magazines, uh, porn magazine and it's okay. Because I was a very naive girl, moved to, from Israel at 21. I thought that men are just that way. And at the 11th month, a year of my, my wedding, that's when the, the straw that broke the camel back was that I learned that my husband is having an affair. Huh. And just, he, just to clarify, it, so until then, some of the habits weren't secret. They were... No, it was just you know, the attempt was more to normalize the behavior. Yeah, everybody's everybody's doing that. Everybody's looking at. It. I mean, I remember that we used to go with couples to uh, to a strip club. You know, that was just like a normal thing. Right. And the codependent, that which uh, um, my colleague here Stephanie mentioned, is yeah, I was a, a very um, very codependent, doing what my husband is happy to do. Uh, keeping him happy, and uh, but what? But by the time I, I, I was uh, in my past, uh, being in the army, I was working as a spy. I'm not going to go into much to it, but uh, <laughs> I found out on my own that my husband is having an affair at the day of my anniversary. On the day and of your 11th talk, anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in New York, and we made a pact that... It doesn't sound like such a good spy that it takes 11 years to figure it out. I'm kidding. Yeah. 11, 11 years is, is usually, it's either 7, 11, 21, 24. Like a breaking point. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a recalcula recalculating if this is a marriage or not. <laughs> I heard, so, heard that. I heard so the seven, yeah. Careful. <laughs> Regardless, uh, we, we had a pact that he will call me from his car phone, back then there were car phones, you know, those bricks, in, mm -hmm. you know, between your, your two seats uh, at a certain time. And I was waiting at the hotel. I was on, on, a, on a business trip. And um, 
no phone call. And it was not like him not to call. We were like, we were there for each other throughout the whole marriage. Calling, checking in at each other, nurturing. My husband, he's still, to, till this day, he's constantly my biggest fan, pushing me to become the best I can be. And um, he was always there for me. And I hear in my business trip that was very, it was very, very important business trip. I know he would be interested to know what, how it went, and I did not get a phone call. And I, I call him, there's no answer. So I was smelling something that is just not right. And when I came, when he came to see me in New York, he was over functioning like crazy. And I'm like, come on, something is wrong here. When I got home and I started getting phone call from a lady that I, I was, was introduced to us in a camp that the whole, all the families were in. And I'm like, I put the two and two together and I, I came to him and I said, what's going on? No, nothing, 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 nothing. And for six months, there was uh, things going on at home that I, I just could tell that it's, it's not, it's not, it smells bad. And uh, um, no, it was actually five months. And then we came out clean on Saturday night when a friend of ours says, if you want a good marriage, you just say it all. And he came forward took a lot of courage and he said it and Just I threw a him? fit. Yeah. We okay. did, we did full disclosure. Most of Saturday night. <laughs> oh, no. so without anyone it else. Was... I know often they, they recommend full disclosure with a professional in the room or a third party in the room. <laughs> Ellie, sweetheart, excuse me. If I'm talking like this, it's because my, the, the influence of Texas on me. So, um, I apologize. 26 years ago, there was no such thing as SA or SNR. Right. When I went to my therapist, he didn't even detect it as, a, as an addiction. Right, I, understand. I mean, I didn't have meetings. There was nobody there to come and say, you know, you have an addiction at home. And, and at home, I mean, what I saw around me is constantly fl flirtatious. Um, we supplied X-rated videos to some of family members because they need it. I mean, th there was no such thing as sex addiction. Right. In fact, there are still and people was, who, not, who deny it. I was not religious. Excuse Very me. Different. I was not religious then, so it was not like, oh, you can't do this or. It, it, was some, it was a cultural thing. It became normalized. You see? It, it became normalized, exactly. So when I, I, I tell you, I think I paid enough for my therapist for his jacuzzi and swimming pool <laughs> and new renovation in his home for the 10 years I've seen him. And still, nobody told me this is an addiction. Nobody. Nobody told me, you know, you're codependent. Nobody told me, do you want to stay a victim? Nobody empowered me to, they, 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 you, <laughs> I was there to just sit and talk and that's it. And then the best thing that ever happened to us was that somebody enlightened us to say, you know, there are meetings for you. And that was 12 years later. But somehow, somehow, with divine intervention, when I learned that this is, that, that my husband had, had um, an affair and he came clean, I set a huge, strong boundary that said, I need to feel safe. I need to see that what you're doing is, is, is real. And you have a, a span of a year for me to feel that I'm safe and you're not gonna betray me. Now the betray and the shame was such a pain because now, now when I'm looking back, I see how it is, the pain is so much ancient. The pain of shame and blame and, and betrayal 
it's such an ancient pain that it's exasperated by my husband's affair and addiction. To understand it's At the time you found out about it, at the time you found out about the affair, did you connect it to the other things that had been normalized for so long, like the porn and the strip clubs and the other behaviors, or you still saw it as two separate, separate things? That's a great question. You know, my husband was still having porn addiction even after the affair, and I looked at it as this is his problem. He wanted me to be his web chaver, you know, the uh, accountable, uh, accountable uh, person to see if he's partner, getting yeah. a, a, a website or not. And at first I said yes, and then in the other, I'm like, oh, this is corroding inside of me. I don't want to know this. This is your problem. Go handle it. So I set this boundary again. I hate to I, tell I want to you say this. something. I want to say something about your husband. For those who haven't heard his story, um, we, uh, we did a webinar together a few weeks ago called Exit Strategy. Um, I believe your husband has helped, I think he said over 1,300 people get sober from pornography, and today he's uh, turned his life into uh, one of complete dedication and service to people who struggle with this. So I just want to put that out there about him, and if they want to learn more about his work, uh, he's one of the uh, founding members or one of the anchors at Guard Your Eyes. And if you want to learn more about his work, besides for your website, 2B1Institute.com, there's also the, uh, the webinar we did together where he goes into detail about his own story and what he learned and how he helps a lot of people. So I felt that it was important to, to put that um, I appreciate that. Like I what, said, it's not what it's turned into. The yes, pain has like certainly said, converted to, to a purpose. His name is David Hyam, or David Hyam. Uh, like I said, you know, thank you for mentioning that it's very hard for me to go back there because this is not the same man. I, I, I'm doing this because I think it's so incredibly important for women out there to realize that when there is this habitual behavior of watching porn, looking at porn, from, from the small surface thing that says... Um, it's a surface thing of, of flirting, which it, it, it's, it's a family thing. I saw it in the family to soft porns in movies. To it, it, They call it a chronic gradual disease. And this is what I saw. This is what I saw. The boundaries were, I had to take care of myself. And I don't know how, what happened, how I learned this, but um I, I, had a, I had a lucky star that taught me, Miriam, if you're not going to be setting strong boundaries and, and know what your threshold is of how much you can put up with and what you're not going to put up with and, and just say how you feel, you, it, 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 it's, it's not going to be a marriage. Yeah. And can I so, pause you so for a second? Because it sounds like you're going into the solution now. And I want to get to um, Rabbi Jacobson. A little bit and then we'll get into um, this part this part of the conversation the one thing that I heard between both um, you and Stephanie and I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth but it sounded like you both got to a point where you had to look more at what you were doing versus what they were doing and that becomes that sounds like a very important shift but I appreciate both of you for um, sharing for going back there and sharing that pain because likely there are people on this call who are in that place and seeing someone, both of you talk very comfortably or, or relatively comfortably about this, this topic and to be able to do that is not possible the first time. So in order to connect with someone who's there is to really share the pain of that story and the details, the beliefs that we held then, the beliefs that were shattered and so on. So Rabbi Simon, I'm sure you're no stranger to these types of stories and topics. I don't have to uh, lead you in with too much. What, is, what, what are some thoughts and what are some, uh, a message? Well, firstly, I'm sitting here, uh, you know, emotionally empathizing to both Stephanie and Miriam, the courage to speak about this, to, uh, before that, to confront your own inner challenges. And I just want to say my heart goes out both of you and I, 
I don't have the words to describe my respect and even awe of uh, just uh, basically embracing your vulnerability and uh, all the darkest sides of human nature that emerge in these type of circumstances. You know, first being that codependent and helping feed it, and then going through what was called rock bottom or other epiphanies, which includes the shame and the guilt. I mean, um, so first thing I think it must be acknowledged and anyone listening to this needs to know, no matter where you are in your life, people like Stephanie and Miriam are tremendous, tremendous assets. They're real, uh, they really manifest and personify what human dignity is about because I think at the heart of it all, what strikes me in hearing your story, and of course, many similar stories, but every story is its own story, is when you see the, looking for the right word, the desecration of human dignity, what we would call Selim Elikim, the divine image, both of the addict and the collateral damage, the impact on the spouse or the loved ones, which in many ways is even worse because here you are, an innocent person, did nothing wrong, fell in love with someone for the right reasons, the wrong reasons, we'll say for the best reasons, and then discover this uh, shameful uh, form of total betrayal of themselves and of you, of everything that really is about what you want to love and build in your life. And you're suddenly this uh, victim, firstly of secrets that you didn't even know about. So the, and secondly of the whole, the patterns and routines that both of you described each in your own way. You know, it's like a whole story, but when you fill in the blanks, you see this ups and downs it can only, I mean, it's like a nightmare, a nightmare of denial, accepting what's true, what's not true. Can I believe, can I not believe? I really want to trust the one I love. It's critical to uh, recognize that the essence of it, and I'm using now Torah terms, is the trampling upon and the betrayal of and the abuse of human dignity. The creation that each of us was created in the divine image with indispensable value, beauty, sanctity, holiness. And newborn children all have that. And you are all newborn children as all of us. And then life takes over and suddenly you're in this swamp, in this uh, nightmare where your own person, your own value, you start questioning your own judgment. So I think it's vital to recognize that we essentially human beings have the full right and the full, um, I would say even gift of our divine human dignity, that the majesty of what it means to be a human being. And to me that stands out immediately, both on both sides. When that gets contaminated and toxified and stolen from you, it's literally like rob robbed from you. It's another form of abuse. You know, a child being molested, or I don't want to use the harshest terms, a child being raped by a loved one, we all understand what kind of damage that does. But you know something? Even if you're an adult and you're in some way abused by your partner, willingly or not willingly, whether they're in control or not control, it's exactly the same impact. It's stepping on and in every possible way undermining the thing that is the most vital component in a human being, and that is self-value, self-esteem healthy self-confidence. So the real challenge is how do you get out of that? And when you do discover yourself, you do discover your voice and that you have the right to have a voice and realize it's not the contradiction to the love of your codependent and realize that the more you can embrace your love of yourself and your voice and your dignity, the more you'll actually be helpful. That's when the transitions begin to happen. But to get there, sometimes it requires rock bottom. Sometimes it requires real, I mean, many situations you'll find mothers, I think Stephanie said it, that she was doing it for her son. Some will do it not for themselves because you already feel, either you feel such like such a shmata and worthless, or you just feel trapped in that, uh, what they call the, the Stockholm syndrome, where you can't get out of it. So you need something and often it's a child or some other value that you say, no, that's already crossing a line. And then what happens is the emergence 
the reemergence, I should say, of the true human, the true spiritual dignity of your spirit. So what I take from this is number one is, of course, you can't describe the pain, but above all, we're doing this in order to be able to give strength and hope and some encouragement to people out there who may not yet be at the stage where they're ready to uh, discover something. They may not want to hear it. They may not want to believe it. They feel that's their only life they have. They think, you know, once you breathe toxic air for too long, you start thinking that's my only option. So of course we want to come away with this, that two heroines like yourselves, who in many ways, I have no doubt, and I'm sure we'll hear about it from you. Once you've, once you've regained, you reclaimed yourself, have reached probably heights in uh, human dignity and divine image that, that other people who never was, rip, robbed from, was never robbed from them may never reach a level of refinement. And I feel again, humbled and honored to be here and weigh in. I mean, I don't want to sound like an observer that's a commentator, like, uh, you know, the guy that's calling the, 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 the play, play by play, because I have to say, you know, my own life experiences, I've not had this directly, but indirectly by dealing with people and speaking to people and really putting myself in their shoes. The, the horrendous pain that you see from the collateral damage is far, far worse than the original problem. That's how it is, because the original problem, if you can nip it in the bud or in some way contain it, but once it starts impacting and it starts hurting others, Ellie said it at the outset, it's much harder to deal with the people you've hurt than hurting yourself. Because it's like, wh why would I do that? I, I took a beautiful person and I hurt them. You know, it's one thing what I did to myself is also unacceptable. And then it becomes something that we look for ways to heal. But the goal, of course, is to know that at the end of the day, the human dignity, the divine image in which we're created is more powerful than any type of abuse, any type of, um, uh, I called the before, um, desecration or a betrayal or a violation of that. If we keep that in mind, that we say every morning in the prayer, the soul you have given me is pure. To me, that's the single greatest, most powerful healing and recovery statement because everyone says it, even those that have been terribly addicted or those that have been hurt by those that have been addicted because it tells you that the pure always remains stronger than the impure. It's a matter of accessing it. That's not easy, but we have to always remember there's a light there. There's no way that the spark ever is extinguished. Sometimes it needs a lot of digging. But I think that if one message that comes out of the story is that we can fan that spark and get it to come alive again, that's the secret to recovery and growth and uh, not remaining in your own eyes damaged goods, but actually reaching heights that are unprecedented. Those are my spontaneous Simon, feelings in listening to the story. Yeah, what's, what's interesting listening to you is that your message is as relevant uh, for the addict as it is for the, I'll use the word co-addict. The, the word codependent started as co-addict. So it's, it's, it's a message for both. If we don't um, lose sight of that, and that's been the process. The process for myself has been to recover my, my self-esteem. And then, and when it starts shifting and admittedly the last couple of weeks have been probably some of the toughest for myself in recovery in a while. And some of the, the urges and thoughts around porn coming back and some other stuff. And what I find is that the beliefs that sit there behind that, which the beliefs are essentially what fuel the addiction are often rooted in shame. This idea is that I, I did something that, uh, that can't quite be redeemed and from both sides, that has to happen when another human being makes us feel that way or it's that we're the cause of the pain to someone else. And then also to somehow recognize that we still deserve our dignity, despite the fact that we've been caused pain and have caused pain to others in the big book. Well, the uh, in the big book and talking about steps eight and nine, steps eight and nine deal with amends. Right? Step eight made a list of all people we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And step nine made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do them would injure them or others. So those are the steps where that's dealt with. And when it's talking about those steps, it says we go there and we're honest and we're honest about our mistakes. And what we do is make an amends. And uh, my sponsor is always very careful to remind me that when we, um, an amends is not the same as an apology. It's not saying, I'm sorry. It's saying, how can I make it right? 
Uh, whenever I write an amends and I show it to him, he tries to remove the word I from it as much as possible. There's no excuses. There's nothing else. It's just an amends. It's, financially, it's the most easy to understand where if $100 was taken, $100 is returned. It's not, I'm sorry for taking the $100. It's, here's, here's it back. It's what can I do to make it right? Certain things are years that are lost and it's not possible to give back years, but it is possible to put it in the hands of the other person and say, what do you need me to do to make it right? And what I love, it says in the, in the big book, it says, we go there with our, with our chest up high. We go there with our head held up high. So we did make these mistakes and we're fessing up to it. But at the same point in time, I think it's, it, it says something very similar to what you're saying. I, I don't have the words in front of me, but the feeling I got was the same, that we are children of God. And we stand in front of people saying, these are the mistakes we've made and we're ready to make them right. And we apologize for it. But we're also not a doormat to be walked on simply because of those mistakes that happened. So it was, it was very relevant to me hearing your message that it's, it's, for, it's for both. It's for both. It's a beautiful message for anyone affected from addiction. Our dignity is not lost. I wanted to just add, if I may, once you mentioned that, you know, if you go back to the story, the biblical original story in Genesis, in Beratius, I, I, I think people don't realize the power of it, that after Ad, Adam and Eve are uh, naked, they're born naked, they're adults, and they're not ashamed of their sexuality. Why? Because it's part of the divine plan. It's a seamless flow. It's like young children. A newborn child is not ashamed of its sexuality. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's never been hurt. It's never been abused. It's never been selfish. It's part of a deeper uh, picture. But then they eat from the tree of knowledge. Not when knowledge, they suddenly become aware of themselves, self-conscious. As they become self-conscious as opposed to divine conscious, there's now a uh, split. There is a uh, dissonance between who you are and why you're here. And what does God say to, uh, uh, so then they are ashamed, and because of their shame, they cover themselves. Okay, then Adam hides from God because he's embarrassed. He's embarrassed that he's betrayed himself, that he's violated his mandate. You know, the first time he lost his innocence, he lost his uh, seamlessness, purity. And God says, where are you? Of course, he knew where he was. Physically, he knew where he was. But you've betrayed yourself. I don't recognize you any longer. We were connected. We had a partnership here. It's like you say to a friend, not, I know where you are, but we're, we're, you're not present. And it's such a profound statement because when you go through those stages, you realize shame is a natural expression of something that's wrong. Think of it like pain. Pain is not pleasant, but it's telling you there's something wrong. Go do something about it. Shame is exactly that. It's telling you something is wrong. What are you ashamed of? You're ashamed of because in a way you've betrayed. There's a part of you that's ashamed of another part of you. And that search of who are you, Ayeko, where are you, and reclaiming is really the story. Now, I'm not saying this makes it easier, but there is a, there is a formula of... Well, I think it puts a vision on the horizon of possible, right? That despite the fact that someone goes through horrible things or even does horrible things, there's redemption that's possible. Absolutely. May, I, may I add something? Of course. Shame, when, when I experienced the shame, and because of it, I was, I was raging. This is my, this is my, my way of, of uh, this is my drug of choice, like they say. It's because underneath it, I was feeling that I was powerless and needing to control. Okay. When when I when I'm when I'm coming and and and, and re reacting to my husband for what he has done, and I'm feeling the shame, is because I'm feeling that I'm less, and this is a a, a perverted way of thinking about my worth, because I I stayed away from listening to what I'm saying every morning. So if I know that I'm pure. What is there to be ashamed of? What to be ashamed of is there's no room to be shamed. There, what, there, can you name the shame, of... Miriam? Can you, can you name what, what is the thought? Is the thought that you're wrong because your husband did something wrong? The thought is, is that he, he betrayed me. How could he have done it? I'm not enough for him. That's shameful. Got it. Oh, got it. Okay. I'm not enough for him. What it. is this? I'm beautiful. I'm keeping my weight. I'm... I'm, 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 I'm watching how I look, I, I, I keep up with myself, I'm a, I'm a leg. 
And, and what are you doing? So that's a huge shame. Right. So the shame there is, is coming from a place of, of gaiva. I want to be in control of you. I want to change you. When yet I'm not accepting that the fact is that this is, this is who he is. And I'm, no matter what other people do to me, I, it's, I'm having a choice how to react. You know, if, if I know who I am, it wouldn't matter to me what other people are doing. And of course, this is my husband. I have to separate it, my husband from the disease rather than cop, put it you know, together and saying he is the disease. He's not the disease. Right. He is, all, he is just as pure neshama as I am. He just have a, a set of, of, of problem, of, of uh, a set of, of, of challenges that God has given into him that he could manifest even better men, men than he is. But again, this is the shame. This is the biggest work that I've done. It was the shame. And yes, again, and that... like I mentioned before, the shame is an ancient feeling that I felt for a long, long time ago before I even encountered the, 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 uh, the um, before you met your husband, probably. Absolutely, because, you know, you grow up, if, if chas v'shalom, God forbid, you, you pee by, by mistake, you, you have an accident, you'll be shame. Why aren't you perfect? Or you're not, you're not bringing a, a hundred in, in your score in, in school. It's, oh, it's, it's shame, shame, shame. Look, that's our society, unfortunately. Yeah. Miriam, I'll tell you a story. Um, one of the things that impacted me when I was starting to notice that I wanted to live a life without porn and then eventually getting to that place that I uh, put the kibosh on it. And one of those things was a video I came across where a porn star was talking about why she stopped making porn. And the turning point for her was walking into her boyfriend um, and finding him watching porn. <laughs> and she said it shifted her whole perspective, where until then she thought a bunch of people are watching me because I'm more attractive than their spouses. I'm more attractive than who they have available to them. And suddenly she's like, I walk in on my boyfriend, the one person that I'm willing to have sex with without pay, without money, from love, and he's watching someone else. And it shifted her whole view of what pornography is. So I encourage those who... Um, as, as someone who watches porn, it, it op who's watched porn and watched way too much of it, it operates on a completely different track than um, just whether someone who uh, I love or, or is available to me is enough for me. It's more likely that I feel fear and the fear makes me go to porn than that I feel aroused and then I go to porn. And then when I feel ashamed, then yes, then once I'm ashamed, and I'm in that space, and I'm less likely to want to interact with another um, human, with another human being. In sex, um, in in sex addiction recovery, they often say that this is an intimacy disorder. And we have tr when when we have trouble being intimate with another person, that's where, and the more that gets exasperated, that's where the problem uh, really surfaces. Stephanie, I have a question for you, and I'm debating whether or not to ask it. Should I ask it? Shoot, I'm here anyway. Shoot. Okay. So I, know you don't know I do the actually question, want but... to say something also afterwards about the shame that Miriam touched upon, but yeah. yeah but Absolutely. After. So, so um, work it in as well. And if you're not comfortable with the question, if you change your mind after I ask it, just tell me no. But when I hear Miriam's story, right, there is clearly um, a happy ending attached to it. 26 years after exposure, uh, 12 years later, she eventually found recovery. Um, and now they're both in a place where they're helping a lot of people through it. Does your story have a happy ending? Are you in the happy ending? So my story is still happening and my story is one of living and more than just surviving. Each day is a choice that I make of, of that leads me to the end of the day where I can do my gratitude list every night. I don't know if you see them on Instagram. I see them on Instagram all the time, yeah. But Beautiful. The, the fact that that's part of my day-to-day -day life, that's proof in the pudding that there's, that I'm, I'm, I'm more than just content in my life today. Six, almost six years post, you know, messy passing. So, so the answer is yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful, it's you a beautiful thing to say. Beautiful. Is that 
um, there doesn't always have to be an obvious happy ending for there to be joy and gratitude and hope. I want to, I want to, you know, on that topic last summer, I remember New York and Long Island, they did like a whole get together of the police, the Hatsala. I, I know a friend told me about it after the effect and she shared that she shared, she, she was frustrated. She went to it. She's a therapist herself. And she, she said that, you know, there was Hatsala, there was a Hatsala member there. There was the police department there. There was a therapist there. She said, there was no one like you there. She said, I said, but I was like, you know, there was no one sharing their personal experience. There was no one there telling them like, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. This is what you might be feeling and you're too afraid to speak up about it. This is a place where you can go to and this is where it's helped me. And I told her, I was thinking about it and I said, but my husband passed away. She said, but you're not focusing on that. You're focusing on what the result of, what, what it brought you to and how you're living your life on a day to day. The, the, you know, the bigger picture of life uh, and God orchestrating so many things in my life, you know, Mati was part of that process to, you know, help so many people. And there was the word victim that, you know, that has been mentioned, you know, both by Miriam and by R Rabbi Jacobson. And I share this, um, and I shared this with people and every, uh, the first time I ever really got up to speak was at Mati Shloshim. And a week prior to that, Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson gave a speech that I heard, and he talked about Yosef Atzadik, and he gave, you know, the brothers finally meet him, and he said, you know, the brothers are feeling however they felt, the, 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 the devastation, the embarrassment of just now what they did to their brother, selling them what they did to their father. And in the Torah, it says straight out, Lo moti, Hashem shlachani. you didn't sell me, I, I, I wasn't sold, I was sent. And I heard Rabbi Jacobson say this three weeks post my husband's death. A week later, I got up in front of a group of people and I said out loud, I, I said, I gave this over. I said, I wasn't sold. I was sent. I don't know where my journey is going to take me, but it's going to take me someplace. These experiences, these series of events, these puzzle pieces, I'm on this yellow brick road taking me to Emerald City, Laha, you know, like, you know, Kava Homer. That's where I'm on in my life. The mic drop has taken me to like, uh, it took me to that bridge. I'm on, I, I went on a golden bridge as a result of, of my experiences. But I, I chose at that moment, and I chose even prior to that, that I'm not going to be a victim of my circumstances. I never played the, oh, poor me, nebach, she's an almana. I never, those words never came out of my mouth. And it motivated me to make better choices in my life. The choices that I've made have led me to me becoming who I am today. And the example that I am, because it is a reflection in the home also, you know, David was six weeks old and he refused to eat because there was so much tension. I had to learn, had to, I had to navigate new things in my life. And there's like that famous saying, when you start like, working inwards, the outwards start to change around mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I, I, saw it, I saw it manifest over time. Yes, from the time that David was born until Mati passed away, David was two and a half years old. So I guess, you know, over the, you know, the scheme of life, it seemed like a short your period. Your son David was two and a half years old when your husband passed away. David was two and a half years old. Right. And, but there was still so much happening in that time. And, you know, like Miriam had said as well, there was a point where sobriety was part of Mati's life and his sobriety, because mine, our, our sobriety dates were different. Because I, 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 I knew that I couldn't, I, you know, the first thing you learn in al is you can't control, you can't cure, and you're not the cause. And once I accepted those things, I decided that I needed to take my route. And I had, to, and all of a sudden I learned this word, I never knew what the word boundaries was. I'm American. I was, you know, English is my first language, but there's a whole set of, of there, a dictionary, Merriam Webster, you know, these words just were, were gibberish to me at the time. And I learned so many new words. And not only that, you know, just like I'm, I'm saying, I'm sorry, it's, you know, actions speak louder than words. I learned how to apply those words into my life. I learned what the word boundary meant. And I learned what that meant. And what I also learned what that meant for me. You can ask Siri the definition of a word, but to apply it to my life, that was a whole nother ballgame because my needs are different than someone else's needs. 
my boundaries are different than someone else's. So when I share my story, I share my experience. And the reason why I continue to is because there's so many people that say, you're talking, you're, you're telling my story. Are you me? Do we have the same parents? You know, all these different things, you know, that come up throughout the times that I share. And they ask me like, what did you do? I'll share my experience, strength, and hope. And that's what I do. And when I say, you know, this is the boundary that I set up. There was a point where I had to separate from Mutsi because I couldn't trust him. And I moved into my parents' home for over five months. And there was a level of mysterious nefesh doing that also because, you know, emotionally it was toxic as well. But I, at that point, I learned different tools on how to navigate things in my life. I'm always going to be surrounded by people that aren't fit into my perfect mold of, you know, everything. And what this life has taught me over the last eight years is that I've learned a new way of living in reality. This whole pandemic, like you mentioned, has been a challenge. There has been so much bracha, so much like, you know, we were schmoozing beforehand of just like what it's been like this tangible, like this new quality of life. But because I learned what the word acceptance meant beforehand, it helped me navigate the last 12 weeks of my life, which has been- When you're talking, I'm hearing a lot of, both in terms of sharing story. I mean, this is one of the things I've done a lot of is sharing my story. And that's what propels me is when I hear exactly what you're saying, people tell me that, hey, I hear myself Right. in you. And then this other part is when the pandemic hit, feeling is one of the reasons, one of the motivations to start this, these uh, series of webinars. And Rabbi Simon and I were on a phone call together and I felt that the work I had been forced to do, quite frankly, in recovery, suddenly is becoming useful. It was always useful outside of recovery, Crazy. but now suddenly it's useful in a real life scenario that's affecting the whole world. I felt like I was ended and and at an advantage for the first time because of my addiction. Not at a I, I had a conversation with my mother-in-law and I share a lot, you know, on Instagram that she, I'm so close to her. And she asked me like how I'm doing. I'm like, I, I feel like I've been prepped for so many things that this pandemic has given me. You know, like the curveballs are, it's not that I'm just like, you know, knocking them out of the park, not at all. It hasn't been easy breezy. The hardest part of this whole pandemic is that Mati's loss has been so highlighted even more for David ever in his life. In the last three months, I, you know, it's been, that has been the biggest challenge to navigate. And there's some things that I can communicate to him. And there's some things where like, I have to learn to give it over to a higher power. Or, How old is you your know, son today? He's eight. He's eight, almost eight and a half. You know, and the understanding, everything that's, that's there now is different. So, you know, it's, it's, there's, but it's been that learning experience. It's taking my recovery. It's taking my, my way of living to a whole new level because it's a choice that I'm making every day and taking the good with the bad. I have a question for um, kind of everyone and Rabbi Simon, when you jump in, if, if you can touch on this, because I'm really curious. So it's both Stephanie and Miriam took the road of, and I as well have taken the road of sharing our stories somewhat publicly in one form or another, certainly by sitting on this panel here. And I know um, of situations, especially in the community where I come from, where the opposite has been done. And someone who dies from a drug addiction, um, it's called a stroke or a heart attack or a mysterious- Or aneurysm. 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 Right, some of these good ones that can just kind of pop up out of nowhere. And I remember, um, a friend of mine sharing online that a guy who I knew had passed from a drug addiction, there was a, a um, but the family didn't want it to be said that way. And instead it was a mis an accident or a stroke, something like that, that was being shared. And they were doing a fundraiser for him for, I, I don't know, a, uh, a shul or a mikvah or something that didn't quite connect. And while, um, didn't quite connect to his life, and they certainly didn't connect it in any way to, to what was to what was going on. And I know Stephanie that you've built a, a learning center, I think, for your for your husband. Mati, Mati actually started it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm saying in this case, it done that, and I felt anger rise, 
and I, I reached out to my friend and said, well, why are you sharing this fundraiser? Like this is not, it's, it's, I almost felt like it was a desecration of the person's memory to, 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 to say that they died for a different reason and were collecting money for some arbitrary cause that benefit everyone. I said, maybe collect money for a rehab, maybe collect money for, uh, for trauma, for therapy, for something that meant was meaningful in his life. Certainly this wasn't. And it just seemed like an opportunity to, to, to raise money. And I'm not sure, maybe, said, maybe you can help me with this. Here, in terms of processing that, that anger myself, when I see that, is, is my way, our way on the panel, is it right? Is it just right for some people? Uh, uh, is it unjustified anger that I have for, for people who don't speak, um, who I don't say don't speak, but lie about why why this happened instead of bringing more exposure. And in the process of bringing more exposure to it, there's less shame. And we all know that shame is the fuel and the, 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 the oxygen that um, addiction breathes. So Rabbi Simon, yeah. thoughts on what I'm saying? Well, you said it right on target. It's all part of the extension of the shame. When people's reputation is more important than reality, um, it's just like those people that committed suicide after they lost money in the stock market crash. I remember hearing it for the first time as a child. I asked my father, why, why life was less important to them than their money? He said, one day you'll find out, yes, for some people, externals, reputation, image, control, power, the illusion of control and power. It's part of the extension of the, of, the, of the shame and therefore people never really facing the reality. You know, what I was going to weigh in, which I think relates to this, is exactly correct. I gave a talk actually a few weeks ago to many people regarding the pandemic on a Zoom. There was almost a thousand people on it. And I brought the story of Joseph uh, among other stories. You see the real formula, the secret, how is Joseph able to get beyond 22 years of being sold into slavery, thrown into prison, torn away from his beloved father? How did he get beyond his own frustration and anger and, and, and uh, wishes for revenge? I mean, it's normal to want vengeance and to at least not accept is because before he was thrown into the situation, he was given the gift of that human dignity I spoke about before. He knew what an neshama was. His father and his mother, Rachel, gave him an unbelievable gift that you are valuable in God's eyes. And no matter what happens to you in life, it happened to you, it's not you. Don't ever identify with your suffering. You know, we've suffered as the Jewish people collectively and individually, but we've never behaved like sufferers. Suffering is an experience, not your identity. And knowing that, no matter what would happen to him, including what did happen, so when he met them, he was able to easily say, because he was already, that was, his, that was what made him tick. He was made of that, those fibers. He was able to say that this is not what you've done to me. He wasn't just getting them off the hook. You don't control my life. God controls my life. The fact that you were the messengers of this cruelty, you're going to have to deal with that yourself. But our trajectory in our life is not controlled by others. This pandemic, for instance, you really don't have control over the virus, over the, over the COVID-19, but you have complete control of your attitude. That's why I believe what Stephanie just said, what you, Ellie, have said, Miriam in other ways, are people who've been through the fire You've already come to discover that life is not in your control and that there's a higher purpose and sometimes you know what it is and sometimes you don't. All those that are, are trying to fight and say, when, I, when am I going to regain control of my life? When is my schedule coming back? Are the ones that are fighting a storm they will not be able to beat. You have to know how to navigate. And part of it is embracing the unknown and the mystery and know that you become stronger for it, not weaker for it. It's the essence of the entire Jewish, the only secret for Jewish survival for almost 4,000 years. How are we able to survive where the greatest empires and the greatest populations with money and wealth and, and, and everything and armies? Because we always recognize we're on a journey that God is leading us on. So no matter what happens to you, it does not define your existence. The worst things can happen, but your faith, your values, your purpose, that remains forever. It's really the essence of uh, Viktor Frankl's logotherapy, which was corroborated in the Holocaust, where he saw those that had that extra edge, 
of purpose and meaning. Though they didn't suffer less, but they had that inner dignity. I am amazed by my question was going to be throwing back to all of you this question. What about someone listening right now that is in the world, was in, in the quicksand and trapped by a spouse that is addicted and they're not, they don't know how to get out of it? What do you do there? How do they get that dignity? How do you know when to walk away, when to stay? Because you can always say, maybe that's my lot to suffer. And, uh, and you end up becoming an enabler, which is another name for codependent. So how do you, number one, recognize when, when to, as they say, to hold them and when to fold them. And, <laughs> and secondly, to have the dignity of your own life to recognize when you can really embrace your voice. Because many people right now are trapped. You know, you were blessed. I have to say, without even question my mind, Stephanie and Miriam, not only was this a gift from heaven, I assure you that in your childhood and your family life, you were given certain validation, a certain reinforcement that gave you the strength. Because there are people right now that feel they deserve to be suffering. They deserve to be worthless. What do you say to people like that? That's what I would like to throw into the picture here, if you don't mind, Ellie. Absolutely. Uh, it's a great I'll question. Be glad to I have, a, I have a client right now that because of the pandemic and be, because of, of the environment that we live in, that everything is texting, her husband is a, is in recovery. He's doing real good work on him. No communicate, no verbal communication. All the communication is on texting for the past two years. And I'm sitting here waiting with her to see when is her threshold will reach that she'll say no or that she will bring bo both herself and her husband to a point that says, are we going to change the communication here or not? So it's really, it's all individual. It's an individual because everybody has his own, like I said, threshold to know how much they can put up with or not. Now, it's very weird what I'm asking for my client on the beginning of, of me working with her to get to take her out of that um, quicksand. Oh, no. I sit and talk to her to put a schedule for every, mo every hour of the day when she gets up in the morning, till so she go to sleep, what she eats, how much she sleep, how much time on computer, how much she drink, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, caffeine, what she eat, how she exercise. Because if she's not going to keep that self-care, you know, they call it boundaries, but they don't understand. They think boundaries is something that I'm going to be uh, enforced rather than it's actually empower you. If you keep that schedule, that simple schedule of taking care of yourself, from what you eat to exercise, to writing in the journal, to, to reflect and, and pray and keep it going, you are strengthening your inner core that you will be finally listening to that pure neshama, that sadeket inside of you, that tzaddik inside of you, that righteous person inside of you that says things to you that you can and you will overcome this. And this, this is my, this is my, this is the ABC for coming, coming out smelling like a rose. If, if I understand correctly what you're saying, it's to take care of yourself to the point that you're aligned enough to know what it is you, you, you need. When it yeah. becomes, right, that's, so you it's that not clarity? something that someone can sit down with necessarily for an hour and arrive at, these are my needs and I'm done. Or even they can get from someone else. Stephanie, you made the point earlier that it's your boundaries, right? Someone else may have different boundaries and you may have others. And it's really being honest with yourself about those needs and checking and reflecting. Right. So Miriam, that's what you were, you were recommending. Yes. It's to, it's to create a habit and rituals of, you know, I love the word spiritual because a lot of people say I'm spiritual, but not religious, or I am spiritual, I'm not spiritual. The best religious definition I've heard for spiritual Religious, it's ritual, you have to. rituals religious. that serve the spirits. Oh, Ellie, religious. Yes. SPI you have. before ritual. What? 
the SPI that's infused in ritual makes it spiritual. Right, exactly. Yeah. Miriam, you're saying? Religious is you have to go spiritual as you want to because you know that you're a partner with your higher power. The higher power that brought you here, that he needs you because he cannot do what, he, what you can do. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm limiting God, but we are partner with God, and that's the spirit. Religious is you have to. Right, right, I get it. But if, for to. someone to know whether or not they're, like the spiritual, spiritual has become a word that's in vogue and it's used a lot and it's popular again to be yeah. spiritual. <laughs> So I, th I think one way of looking at spiritual, the one that resonated the most with me, is what you were saying, right? If you have a ritual of journaling on a regular basis, that's a, a, um, a ritual that serves our spirit. I mean, we're not getting our muscles bigger from writing, right? It's a ritual that serves our spirit. If we have a, a ritual of walking in nature and nature calms us or um, releases stress, that's a spiritual ritual. It, even working out could be a spiritual ritual if, for some people. Right, there's rituals that serve and nourish your spirit. I'm sorry, somebody mentioned over there, that can take many years. Not necessarily if you take part of your regiment daily to connect your higher power and tell him what's going on. You think it, it, it doesn't have to take that long to really check in. No, no. Stephanie, you want to weigh in a it's, little it's bit? The on hardest, the it's the hardest just to check in. And I talk about that also that I had one of the, the, the speeches that I share is that my first Rosh Hashanah was on, it was in a March, it was on March of, of 2013, I think it was 2012, where it was the first time I actually had a conversation with my higher power because I was going to meetings and they kept telling me to give it over to God, give it over to God, just like let go and let, and I didn't know how, how what that meant. I grew up going to a an amazing Orthodox school. I had an unbelievable education, <laughs> unbelievable education, but religion and spirituality, and I've always been more on the, uh, you know, a, a very spiritually connected person. But at that point in my life, my tank was so empty that like, I, there was that moment of this is my lot. This is where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to figure out still how to make myself functional enough that David has a healthy parent, at least one but I didn't know exactly what the rest, where like I actually fit in. And, you know, Rabbi Jacobson, you were saying how, you know, prior to your, you know, leading up to your question, you know, that we're a nation of faith and of dignity, but we're also a nation of action. And you could have all those things, but you can't put all those things into play without action. And same thing, what Miriam was saying is that, you know, I, you know, I say, when people ask me how, like, you know, how did I become the person I am? I worked out. I mentally worked out. I spiritually worked out. I physically worked out. I emotionally worked out. And I dedicated time and I dedicate time every day towards that. When I wake up in the morning, you know, it's so funny because now my son is home all the time and he'll like come into my room and he'll see that I'm awake and he's like, why aren't you coming out? I said, I'm schmoozing with Hashem. I sit in my bed and we, I have this whole morning regimen of schmoozing with God. And I talk about it when I share also, I schmooze with God. I'm at that relationship with God right now. I didn't always, like I said, Rosh Hashanah didn't exist on, you know, on the first of Tishrei every year until I got to a certain age. I, but this is because I, I see that when I devote that time into my life, it's the same thing when I exercise, when I get on the Peloton, I get more energy. You know, that's why I can't exercise at night because I'll be up all night. But, <laughs> I, I, but I have that, I have that energy and I get that energy that I need when I write my gratitude list. I get that, like that burst of, you know, you asked me about happiness. I get that full picture of where I am in life. And, you know, when it comes to whether I should stay or go, you know, it could take, for me, it was a matter of how long I, and how committed I was to my boundaries, AKA self-care into my, um, into my, you know, learning self-esteem was something I didn't know. I didn't understand what that word meant either. Cause I was told always what that was. What do you understand it means now? Now it's, it's number one, it's self-esteem. It's me. No one else is responsible for any of those things. I'm the one who is responsible for how I feel of how I 
you know, hold myself up. It's nice to get a pat on the back from time to time because that was something I never really got growing up. But I'm the one who's generally put, patting myself on the back. It, there was, you know, I'm going up to New York now and I was sharing how, thank God, there's so many family and friends that are so involved on Mati side of the family that are so involved in my life and I love them. They're my family. And someone shared, they're like, you know, it's pretty amazing. Mati really sets you up for so many amazing people in your life. I'm like, I did that. I maintained those relationships. I made the connections and I did all those things. There are times where I need to pat myself on the back and be proud of what I've become and what I've made and what I've established. Again, I maintain those relationships, my relationship with God. And also, like I talk about also is that I listen to myself of where that gut feeling that I never knew what that was. There was a lot of trust. It wasn't just trust with Mati that I had to learn how to gain. I had to learn trust with myself, with my judgment, with my vision. My vision, my perspective was so blurred. I was raised in this mentality of that martyr, martyrdom, martyrism, whatever. I don't know the proper, you know, term. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was raised to be a martyr. That's, you know, what, you know, a Jewish Yiddish mama is supposed to be that. And I had to change my glasses. I needed to get a new prescription. But then you have to first look for the eye doctor and you have to take the time to make people. All these things take steps. And I learned what those steps were in my life. Right, so I want to get to that a little bit of, um, I think there are two ways we can take this conversation for the next little bit of it is one is towards people stuck in the shame of it. And there also be, seem to be some questions related to uh, people who are um, spouses or very closely connected to an addict. And I, I see some of those questions coming in and what, what people should do. So maybe it would be worthwhile if um, maybe a one line check in from those and what is what is this conversation bringing up what is this doing for you if you write too long it'll defeat the purpose of a one-line check-in because we'll just spend the next 20 minutes reading but if you can sum up your thoughts for those who are uh, still engaged in this conversation just into one line one word what it's bringing up and well, validation and well, uh mm -hmm. you know I, i'm sitting here on spielkies because there's something about the shame that I wanted to talk about, which is unfortunately plaguing both my kids right now who are no longer talking to me. The Bit Chaim and I had made it, made it a policy that everybody would know what we're doing. And unfortunately, our kids are um, working on their issues. And at the same time, they're no longer talking to me. The work that, that I've done when I first found out about my husband's addiction is the same work that I'm doing right now with my, my kids' issues. And it, it, I'm, I'm not gonna say, come and tell you, oh, every day is great, I'm in a higher, I'm in a higher place. Uh, uh, like, like they say in, in Hasidus, I'm in Gadlut Mochim, I understand my shlichus, this is my tikkun, uh, who knows what's going on. Can I ask this, because not everyone on the panel, not everyone listening in, I meant to say a few times, to use English words as much as possible. <laughs> well, in a higher sense of self, I, I, I totally believe that the, those 26 years that I've been working on this addiction with my husband, with whatever happened to us, has brought me the strength to put up with what's going on around me, which is the unfortunate shame that you've talked about the institutions that are don't want to don't want to mention about people who uh, committed suicide or overdose to to even me and my husband who yes um we we took what happened to us and we turned it around the work is still it's still going on because unfortunately what's coming up out from the outside world is perfectionism everybody needs to look great you need to look the part you need to look successful and any time that you fail, that means weakness. And um, this, this is work. And if, if I'm not going to keep up with my self-care and my realization that my soul is pure and mistakes are being made as part of humanity, I'm not going to be here talking to you guys. Miriam, if someone has the question, let's go into this. And Jacob said, if someone has the question of, should I stay or should I go? 
the situation should they're I, in right should now. I should I say, if that's where they're stuck right now, they're here listening to this conversation and it's bringing up a feeling that maybe they're enabling, maybe they're being codependent, maybe they're lying to themselves and in a situation that's never going to get better. And they have that question, whatever that means for different people. Should I stay or should I go? Should I stay in the situation? Should I leave? What, 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 do you, what do you tell them? You know, your body is, a, is the best speaker. And your body speaks. And unfortunately, we're in a generation that everything is going fast and you're getting text and you're getting YouTube and you get... Da, 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 da. But at the end of the day, after you've been with your husband, with your spouse... And, and your body is showing you either peaceful or agitation. That's the message, message if you should stay or you should go. My question is this. Is it something, you know, in recovery, there's, there's the 12 steps, which a lot of people know about. There's also the 12 promises, or otherwise I think called the ninth step promises. But there's 12 promises. And one of those promises, and my, you know, I like to see to some degree the end of something when I start. Like, what am I working towards? So when I got into recovery and it was really a place of hope and healing for me is what am I getting from it? And I very quickly learned that I'm not guaranteed more money. I'm not guaranteed a relationship. I'm not guaranteed better sex. I'm not guaranteed anything necessarily that I thought was high up on the list. There are 12 promises that it lays out that these are the things that I will get. And one of the main promises that, not one of the main promises, one of the promises that deeply resonated with me. And I used to read it every morning. Say, okay, this is what I'm working towards. And I would sometimes dialogue also like, hey, I'm working towards this. Like, this isn't true for me right now. Like the one promise that I think is not true for me right now is fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. And I've worked my ass off on these 12 steps and I still have less fear of people and less fear of economic insecurity than I once did, but it's still very much there. But I want to talk about another promise. And the promise is we will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. So my exactly. question for you is, right? When you say the body can give us that answer, it sounds to me like something that can happen quick. I can sit, take a walk in nature for a couple of hours and know exactly where I am. And when I hear the 12 steps, when I hear they say it, it's through the work, through working ourselves and getting the own gook out of our system and working through the own pain and our own trauma and our own healing. And then the way we've hurt others. Then at the end, at the end of the ninth step, there's a promise that now suddenly our intuition will be strong enough that we will know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. Like, should I stay or should I go? So is there something um, that I'm bringing up that speaks to you on, on that? I'm, I'm more question. If, I'm thinking people want something practical to that. And the way I'm hearing your answer is that it's something they can practically get an answer to very quickly by listening to their body. And I want to know if, if you think that's true. When, when, you, when you hear... When you, see, when you have disappointment about relationships that you have expectation from and you didn't get it, that means that you were conditioned to, to please and you're not in a, in a healthy relationship of give and take from a, from a place of, of, um, of harmony. So, Liz, you know, it's a great question and I would like to give them tool rather than me speaking too much about it because this is my language. Right. I would, I would highly recommend to go to coda.org and see the patterns of codependency and the healthy patterns of recovery from codependency and keep, keep reading it. Keep see if you're doing it, keep seeing if you are in the, in the healthy part. And again, we, we are, that's the beauty of, of recovery. It's, it's a process. It's not the perfection. And it's a journey. It's not a destination. And be constantly curious to find more and more about yourself that is pure. And unfortunately, because of, of the trauma, because of what happened, because of the fear, because of needing to control and all the... We need to, to have a change of attitude. And the change of attitude is through the process. So give yourself time. Be patient. Rev Simon, yeah. come in for us. I'm sure you get this question um, yeah. not on panels I, in front of people. <laughs> what, what, I, how do you, I, how do you I, counsel I, people with this? Yeah, I would add to the equation a few key points. Um, Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem within the system where the problem was born. 
uh, it's really based on a Talmudic statement that says, Ein chavosh mater Let me translate. Someone who's tied up in fetters cannot free themselves. If you're in a pit, you can't just free yourself because you're biased and prejudiced. Anything you do may be part of your own problem. You may be your own worst enemy. And that's especially true when you're entangled with a loved one or at least perceived loved one that is uh, addicted or dysfunctional and you become part of this uh, vicious cycle. So how do you deal with that? That seems like an impossible uh, conundrum, a catch-22. So the answer is like anything. If uh, toxins enter, toxins can leave. You need fresh air, which is why it's vital to have a third party outside of yourself that you can consult, a mentor, a friend, someone you can trust, which I see a lot of people who are trapped in this place don't want to talk to new people because they're threatened because no one wants to be challenged. No one wants to hear that you know you're screwed up or that but you're messed up There can also be the shame. Life. Yeah, the shame, the pain. So number one is it's vital because you need to have, just like if you were going to now invest in a new business or buy a home, you're going to have a lawyer or an accountant helping you. You're not just going to rely on your own uh, resources. You need to have someone you trust because they can add a perspective. That doesn't mean that you're going to change your life overnight, but at least a fresh perspective. That's, I think, vital, vital, which can be a friend. The second point I would make is this. There's a, there is a key litmus test to know whether something's healthy or not healthy, and that's called demoralization. If you're busy and involved in any activity that ultimately demoralizes you, that ultimately weakens you, where you feel disempowered and not motivated, you can rest assured it's coming from unhealthy forces, unhealthy shame, what, what the rabbis maybe would say from the Yetzir Hara, from your, the, the evil inclination, because it has no benefit. It's depressing you, it's demoralizing you, it's breaking your spirit. If there's something that motivates you, you cry, you're even depressed, but it motivates you to make change, you know it's coming from a healthier place. So that's a question you have to ask yourself. The life that you're living right now, whatever it is, what's happening to you at the end of the day? You're feeling empowered at the end of the day? You wake up excited about taking on new challenges? Are you, how you see some progress? Now, people who are really trapped don't want to even ask that question. It's too dangerous. They won't ask that question. But you have to always, everybody have to know where they are on the journey. Some people may be able to hear this, and say, you know what, at least I have a question to ask. Because at the end of the day, all healing begins with awareness of the issue. If, you know, the Baal Shem Tov said that there's a concealment that conceals the concealment, which means you don't even know there's a problem. Or you <laughs> minimize it to the point and say, it's not so bad. Not so bad. He's a loving guy. Yeah, yeah. He, once in a while, he gives me a slap. Or the other ways that he hurts me, but it's not, wasn't his, it was me, et cetera, et cetera. So then there's a concealment where at least you know it's concealed. So I really think of it like a, like a spectrum. Depends where you're at. There are people, there's no doubt in my mind, and I've met people who right now, if they're listening to this, it's already a good sign because they're at least listening. There are some people who wouldn't even tune into something like this. It's too, fright, too threatening. But if someone's listening to this, you have to remember there are some people that can hear a little, a little more, a little other. I mean, I would, I'm sure if someone asked Stephanie, and I would ask, or Miriam, or others that were in this situation, could anything have been said to you when you were in the throes, before you hit your rock bottom, before the epiphany? Could anything have been said to you? Would you have been receptive to anyone saying anything? Or you wouldn't have let them in? Denial is a shield. Mm -hmm. No. Right, You're exactly. Right. So, so you have to be very sensitive. I've sat with people who I saw clearly were in total denial. So I didn't come. You, don't, you never go in a full-out assault on a human psyche. Even if you know they're wrong, even if you know they're really messing up their lives, you have to plant seeds and seeds begin to take sprout. In Some the people, right, right, exactly. Some people may take more time than others. I think sensitivity to that is critical. You can't shake somebody up and just say, I'll shake you out of your illusion and wake up. It doesn't work that way. So I think it's a combination of bringing in fresh air. I'm just summing up what I said, fresh air and Looking at your own life, are you proud of yourself? Does it look like this is going toward a uh, happy ending, a happier place? 
And if the answer is no, that I'm demoralized and I'm doing things wrong, it may, be, it may be very difficult, but it may become time to start looking at other options. And I'm the last person to tell someone to just leave your spouse. But you know what? If the spouse is so toxic and no change happens, no, I mean, I'm very happy for Miriam, but I would ask one more, Miriam, if your husband never changed, what would you have done? God forbid, you know? In Stephanie's situation, um, different circumstances determine that, but these are important questions to ask. I want to make one more comment before I want to love to hear from the others. I don't want to, was, I totally agree with you, Stephanie, about the action. The Jewish people as a whole and individually, they never really asked, why did God do this to me? Why am I suffering? Why do good people suffer? Why did I get stuck in this situation? They always ask, what am I going to do about it? Now? Right. What am I going to do about it? It was always like this. My, the, the dignity remained intact. You cannot destroy me. It's like the Jew before he was shot by the cruel Nazi. And he asked to say his final prayers. And the Nazi said, what are you saying? He says, I'm thanking God. He says, you're thanking God, you miserable Jew. Look, what you're, look at your situation. You're at my mercy. Where's your God? He said, I'm thanking God that he did not create me like you. In other words, you can kill me, but you're not going to destroy my soul, my spirit, my dignity. And at the same time, what the Jews did after the Holocaust, and they always did this, they built. They built their lives. They forged ahead. They did not get stuck in philosophical quandaries and psychological dilemmas of why and analysis. They forged ahead. But it was not just forged ahead in denial. They forged ahead knowing, I don't understand the things that have happened, but I know God led me to this place and I can rebuild and I can reclaim and I can be greater than ever. And no one's going to take my spirit, my neshama, my soul that is pure. If you're, you're able to hold on to those principles and act on them and be around people, around people that are that way, that is a, the key to all success. I do want to um, add one thing is that in some cases, the addict causing the collateral damage is not a spouse. It could be a child also. And uh, I would imagine that the same principles, that the same principles apply. Right? Whether They're much more it's, difficult when it's your child, much more difficult. Because, you know, you can divorce a spouse. You can't divorce a child. I want to actually just on that topic and the same thing, you know, how I mentioned in my story that we went to Alaska and Vancouver and, you know, we were supposed to go to Key West. Divorce doesn't change unless you change. Like you can take that same scenario and go into the same relationships and go into that cycle of insanity. There's still action that would need to be taken. Otherwise you just, a, a person can get stuck in that same cycle. So unless good point. It's a good point, you know, a person yes. looks at themselves honestly, you know, all that that's been there and all that, um, you know, you, again, you could be victimized, but you don't have to be a victim of your circumstances and you could still grow. Otherwise that, that, that baggage. But Stephanie, you know, is it possible? With you. Stephanie, is there ever a scenario where divorce is the way to redemption? I'm sure. Yeah. There is I'm absolutely. Sure. I'm sure. I, I, if, if the thing is, is honestly, there was there was talk between me and Mati on that. It was it was it was it was there was a, a, a set of, of of boundaries, you know, of like if you were to relapse again, what were to happen? It, you know, we had. Oh, this is a point that I wanted to bring up also. Uh, you know how it it was a journey for me to you know recognize what it was that I needed to do along the way. And again, there was that third person. There was, there was a person who was our middle man who we both trusted. Um, and we spoke to a lot, uh, you know, with every, uh, you know, along the way. Um, we had, um, a, 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 we happened to have a, a rub that Mati respected, which was a hard thing for him. Um, but there was, there was um, the part that he needed to see was that I was following up with myself. So it got to a point where I was in Al-Anon and I was working my steps with the sponsor and I was doing certain things. And I remember my sponsor told me that my head and my heart and my feet all need to be aligned. Is that if I'm going to put my foot down, I have to keep it down. I can't be, 
oh, but he's showing some signs of something. Okay, I don't have to wait a whole year. I don't have to do this, I don't do that. I finally learned how to put my foot down and keep it there, detach with love. It wasn't me being like, you know, this officer and looking for all the bad. I stopped doing that. It was a waste of my time and energy. And I started, and, and that's what it was. The first time when I moved into my parents' house that time, he was thrown a curveball because he thought he had full, like, you know, he still, the, the addiction still had power in our lives up until that point. I still let it, you know, I would ask him to leave. If you can come out clean in a drug test and you can come home. But there was like that same pattern. And we repeated that pattern over and over again until I said, you need, you can't come home until you go into rehab. And he said, no. And I said, fine, I will leave. And I picked up our son and I moved into my parents' house. And that's when things got real. Cause he saw that I was no more games. And, but, and then we, we figured out what worked for us, you know, and what, you know, with that middle person of what I needed and what commitments and, you know, the guidelines that worked for us with the boundaries, um, that and and that led us to a stronger understanding of where we were in our own lives where we needed to be in our marriage and whether or not this marriage was going to continue or not all those things were going to help us it wasn't a black and white there's a black and white answer all the time these things take time it could take a couple of months it could take a, it can take a little bit longer but for us that's that's what worked for me in our situation um what this is bringing up for me is uh, something my sponsor often tells me that in, in recovery, life becomes unpredictable. And I had to think about that a little bit. Like, what do you mean it's unpredictable? Right? In some ways, it's predictable. I'm sober. And what he means by that, I think, and he can chime in because I think he's listening, but um, what he means by that, as far as I understand, is that when, when we're trying to control, we're going for a certain outcome. So we're saying that I definitely need to be in this relationship. This has to happen no matter what. And then the same thing happens over and over again. Whereas in recovery, we enter into situations where we say it depends. And I'll step into something and depending on the way it goes is whether or not I will continue versus trying to control. When we control, we're always stuck on a specific outcome. It must go a certain way. This relationship must work. Where we go into a space, and I can tell you that my girlfriend at the time, now wife, told me certain things. She needed certain things. There was a time early in our relationship where it was even more dysfunctional than it was a little bit later, um, where we, it, had, it had to work no matter what. And we're coming from this approach where the beginning of our relationship started with so much intensity that I think we both had a lot of hope for it. That even though there was, it was only intensity, but there was something, we felt a very strong connection. I don't want to make it sound like it was just infatuation. There was a very strong soul connection when my wife and I met each other very early on. And then a lot of the dysfunction started setting in, especially with my own um, addiction and avoiding conversations and numbing myself. And then the shame from it. And then the more the shame escalated, the only thing I knew how to do to deal with the shame was to act out even more and, and on and on. But so for the first year and a half of our dance, there was this idea that this must work and we have to figure out some way, even early recovery, that this must work. And the only way we can define success is if I go into this process and she goes into her process and at the end of it, we're together. And we stayed in that dance for a while. And at a certain point, like my sponsor said, is to enter that space of unpredictability and say, what is, what is going to happen if we say, these are my terms and conditions? Maybe I will, maybe I won't. I have a line that I won't cross. And then it, it brought the relationship to a space that we're both willing to lose it. And if we're both willing to lose it, we have it. It's making me think of someone who I met recently. He heard me talk and I don't think he was there. I think he was there to support his brother who is an addict. And he came to me afterwards and he said that he's struggling with cheating on his own wife and what he should do. And I, I, I said, well, you definitely need to tell her. He said, you think I should tell her now? I said, no, I'm not. I'm not in that place. I don't know her. I don't know you, whether you should walk over to her right now and tell her. But I know that at some point in time, in order to be in a relationship with someone, that truth has to come out. Even if the behavior stops, the truth at some point has to come out. That's what I've seen in my own life. What I've seen with others is how can I call myself, call this a relationship if I have the secret that I don't want the person to know? It doesn't make any sense. Your secret is your secret, sir. Yes, exactly. 
And his, his response to me was, well, if she finds out, maybe I'll lose it. If she finds out about this, maybe I'll lose the relationship. And I think that that's, that's exactly it. Maybe we'll lose something. When we're willing to lose something, maybe we have it. We don't have it if we're, if we're holding on to it so dearly, we have nothing. But if he walks into someone and honestly brings up the truth, and then she chooses that she wants to work through it with him, then they have a relationship because everything is there. But if he's holding on to it at all costs, it doesn't sound like much of a relationship. It just sounds like control. So I think getting into that space of do I stay or do I go, oftentimes the question itself is the answer. Is Do I stay or do I go? I can ask that question for my whole life and then it'll end. Do I stay or do I go? The answer depends. Let me start with a certain set of things that I'm going to do, a certain set of conditions that I'm going to say, these are my bottom line. And then depending, the decision is almost not made by the person asking the question. My wife didn't decide whether or not we're together when she said, these are my bottom line for whether or not we stay. And it wasn't whether I, I, I crossed the line. That wasn't where she put it. She wanted to know for herself, A, that I'm working on it, and B, that if something comes up, I tell her about it. That's what she, those were the two things. So if at any point in time I violated one of those, then she wasn't the one who stayed or gone. I was the one who made the decision. I pushed the button. All she did was lay out what her bottom line behaviors were for her and willing to step into that space of uncertainty, of unpredictability, I think is what allowed our relationship to make it this far and hopefully it continues. There's something I would like to also address with the, should I stay or should I go? It's so individualized. And I looked at the 12-step program as such a gift because I don't use it only with the addiction. I use it when um, we lost all our money. And I, and I, I, we, my husband and I have been in a terrible financial uh, situation. So how am I going to... The problem is, is am I going to lose my sobriety in my emotional state of being or I'm going to go and act out by not necessarily going to sex or drugs. I could act out by being mean to my husband or he mean, mean to me. Yeah. So really, 12 Stop is such a great gift that you could apply to anything. Uh, uh, the unmanageability is not necessarily when I'm not getting my drug of choice. The unmanageability is that when my life doesn't go according to me and to Rabbi Simmons, if my husband would have not change this is not we're not here to do 12 step to change the outcome we're doing 12 step to change us to change our attitude about now, now they say you call, you go in because of the addict you stay for you exactly right. so to to ask the question it, it's a it, it's i i'm seeing the benefit of this more about not only about my marriage i seeing the benefit of it of how it's it evolved to, to, for me to become a better person and, and living life and thriving with life rather than surviving life. And, and the action is to take is to take the 12 steps. That's the action. Right. Uh, Miriam, the question, I, wanna... I, the, the, the question I had was really not to you directly. It was really more, let's say you do find yourself and you become stronger and you're able to make the ultimatums and not be trapped under someone else's control and so on. Is there a scenario that that strength can spill over even if your partner is not doing what they need to do? That was uh, just rephrasing. The scenario that it will spill over, spill over to my spouse, you say? Yeah. Of course. In, in Yiddish, in Judaism, one plus one equal one. Okay. And, and, and when you're in the frequency of health, you're attracting health. I mean, a sidebar. Somebody who ate bat in, in China changed the whole world in Africa because of one little micro virus that, that was created by that. I mean, we all connected. In New York too, not just Africa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in New York, not just Miami. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it the yeah. same place? Yeah. So before, before, we get to, before we get to final thoughts, um, Miriam, I don't know if you saw a question that came in in the Q and A where someone was talking about. I don't. I want to address it, but I don't feel qualified to talk about it. Is the the shame someone felt from being used sexually by a sex addict? 
and physically. And she goes into some of those details there. And it's clear, you know, when we use the word collateral damage, I don't know if everyone sees the Q&A. Oh, boy. Or just a, the panelists. Do you see what I'm referring to? The, uh, sure, sure. I, I read that. And again, and it, uh, so can you, can you describe her question as best you could? And if you yeah. have anything to share, and then I'd like to get to final thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you for, for addressing it. In a, in a, and I'm glad that you brought it up because this is, a, this is an issue about every wife and it's every woman out there because we as women, we're being objectif objectified as a sex object to sell cars all the way to make a husband happy in bed. And then the messages that we're giving our kids is horrific. I mean, look what happened at the Super Bowl. And I'm not going to say further. So uh, the, 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 the deal is that we as a society, we as a community, we need to empower our daughters not to be pleasers in order to get love. And the, the color teachers out there, to, that come and, and preaches to, their, to, to our daughters. Every time your husband needs it, give it to him. When they never ever mention, and this is my, this is my, this is my pain here that I hear it so many times. Mary, Mary I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm sensitive to the fact that people didn't read what was said. So let me do my best to explain Please what read was said. I will, yeah. I will expound it more. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So someone is saying like this. Hi, I'm listening to Miriam's story. I'm amazed at her strength. I feel so connected. And she goes on to tell her story about her, um, her ex-husband who had many affairs before marriage and he was considered a top student. But I, then she says like this, she said, I feel a big deal about getting divorced was not about the affairs or, or the porn, but the, the pain she's speaking about. She says, but I personally was being used every night to have sex four times a night in all positions because he needed it. It was about me being used, my body being used. And I wonder if Miriam can touch upon if she recognized that in the bedroom, there were problems as well. And I think, um, Miriam, just to, to touch a little bit on it, I think what happens is someone like myself who started watching porn at a very young age, right? And I, I would, you know, one of the things I, I say is that as a teenager, I had to jump through hurdles to look at porn. Today, a kid has to jump through hurdles not to look at porn. So I'm, I'm talking about mid 90s, late 90s. Right? I was 11, 12, 13 years old. And yeah, you can get dial-up internet, but there was maybe one computer in a home and there certainly weren't smartphones, laptops, all of these very easily accessible ways of, of accessing pornography. And still I managed to. And this becomes our sex education. And uh, I've heard one people, a person, I'll be a little bit graphic because I think it's, it's necessary for this conversation, said that pornography is hands-off sex. Right? What it means is in order to get the, the shots that they want to get, that they have to show sex in a way that it's not real. It's not real. The hands block the view. So oh, everything that they're trying to do is show a very objectified, a very dehumanizing, a very almost abusive form of sex. And that becomes a sex education that someone like myself who's watched a lot of porn, that's what we got. That's our definition of sex. And then eventually when you get a, a person into a room, it's not, it, it doesn't start off with, emotions and affection and hugs and kisses. It goes to a very potentially dark place of objectifying the, the other person. And someone, a woman on the other end of experiencing that is asking the question, what about that shame? What about the shame of dealing with being the person who was used and objectified by the addict? And that's so what what's, is what's your question, Nelly? I think her question, if I understood correctly, is, is what to do with that. If she, she wants you to touch on it, I think to What to, to do what? It. If she's no longer with the husband, so what to do with that? With what? How to get beyond that shame, I would just say. Yeah, she said, she's like this. However, I still have I the shame trying, and guilt. Let me, let, me read, let me put it in her words. I still have the shame and guilt that my body was used, that I had a lack of judgment in my ex, and I got married to him, that I was lied to constantly, and most of all, the guilt for getting divorced. So... You know, Stephanie spoke about that, touched on this a little bit earlier, but questioning our own judgment and having confidence in ourselves. And she's looking and she's a person who made these decisions and there's guilt around all of that. So I think that it's important, you know, Deva Chaim, your husband sent me a message earlier, talk about the collateral damage. And I didn't quite know what he meant, but I think this is what he wants to talk about also, that it, it spills over into so many different areas. It's not just the porn that watch, it's not just the affairs, but even in the intimacy, it destroys the intimacy itself. Those moments 
are destroyed by someone who's used to objectifying and who's learned sex from a uh, who's learned sex from from pornography, unfortunately. Okay, so so okay. I'll start with this. And I'll go for micro and then we'll go to micro, okay? Micro is that unfortunately our, our color teachers are not teaching us how to set boundaries in the bedrooms because they say your husband has a need, you have to, be, to, 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 to give it. But there are three things that he, she, he cannot do and nobody knows this. He cannot wake her up. He cannot wake her up if she's asleep to need sex. That's a boundary. Second boundary, he cannot, he cannot come to her and ask for sex if he's drunk. That's another boundary. Third, need mephias her. What is mephias her? What is it that like he needs to console her? Which means he needs to speak with her. That's a third boundary. So if we, we stay focused on this and tell it to our daughters before they get married, Huge advancement. Now, what do you do when you do give it to him and you feel objectified and all that? Honey, you, didn't know, you, you did not know better. You, are, you, were, you wanted to love him. You wanted to create love. And it says in, in, in our Essanon material, when we read it, we confuse love with, uh, sex with love. We did not know better. So we need to learn what love is. And love is first start with loving yourself. Set the boundaries about yourself. Now, what happened, unfortunately, had to happen because unfor unfortunately, through what happened, you're learning about yourself and your physicality. You're learning about what you want. And you do have a voice in the bedroom to say what you want, what works for you better. Set your boundaries. We never mentioned in this whole two hours, unfortunately, that there is couple recovery of anonymous. And couple recovery of anonymous did tremendous work for me and my husband. And I highly, highly recommend it to couples who are start working with their, with their addiction at home and go as a couple to recover because otherwise it's like two boats sailing in night, separate, not coming together. I feel terrible for you, my sweetheart, that your husband used you and objectify you. And it will take time for you to recover, recover your body, recover yourself. Know that just like Rabbi, Rabbi Simon J Jacobson says, you're pure, you're beautiful. You try to keep the home together. You did the best you can and it cost you. It was a Messiah nefesh for you. It was a, a sacrificing yourself for this. And yes, I, I, I applaud you for the courage that you put up yourself in order to do keep your home together. But then you, you, you were waking up and you realize that you're a special person and you, nobody, no woman should go through such a thing. And I'm sending you all my love with the frequency of, I hope you will recover soon and you will call us and tell us that you're remarried and your marriage is harmonious and beautiful. Thank you, Miriam. I wanted to just talk on, on, on this a little bit personally, um, which is what I've been sharing this whole time. But, you know, we were talking about feeling worthless and worthy and how, like, where we are in all of this. And I know that in my marriage that I felt that, and I convinced myself that if I did whatever it is that he needed, he'd stop using drugs, you know? And I, again, that was a cycle that I was on. And, um, and I lost track of halacha and I lost track of the beauty of Taras Mishbacha. I also was, wasn't educated well, honestly, before I was, you know, a little schnook getting married. Um, but the addiction took over that part of our life. The, 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 you know, Elokaina Shama Shinatatavi, that pure, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, um, there was that toxic fuel that was in our home that was in our marriage. So it didn't really exist. And only after um, I started going to Al-Anon and only after I started healing on that end, did I go back to Kala classes again to, I, you know, I was starting a new marriage, so to speak in ways, because I was becoming a new person. So I needed to learn a whole nother, you know, 
I needed to hear all these things again from a new, like I said, that perspective, that vision, that new reshaping of everything that I was, that I was becoming, you know, and God willing, when, when I get remarried, whenever that will be on God's timing, I'll go for Kala classes again, because the, the, the purity of that home of, of that mitzvah that I have, that I'm responsible for, it is, is, it, it was like a whole new experience for me, but it was only once I started the healing, you know, through Al-Anon that I even realized that I was using, I was making, I, I was, I was doing everything that I could just to please the addiction. I was enabling it. I was feeding it more and more. And it took time again, like, like none of this is black and white and none of this happens overnight. This has been a process and it's been a continuous process in life. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not a race. It's a journey. It's not a marathon. That's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So, and I just, one last thing, you know, with the shame, you know, connected to divorce, connected to addiction. Um, I remember when Mati died, I asked the family, I said, I don't know what you have planned, but Mati didn't die from a brain aneurysm. Mati was very open about his addiction. And I was open about Al-Anon at that time. There was no secrets. And at his Leviah, whoever got up and spoke at his, spoke funeral. Of, at his, at his funeral, I'm sorry, at his funeral, whoever got up and spoke did talk about his drug addiction and mm. did talk about what he, what he struggled with. You know, um, he wasn't a drug addict. He was a, he was, he was, he was a, a, an amazing individual with great qualities and, and God-given talents who had challenges, who had a sickness. So it didn't define everything about him, but you know, I, I said, I said, Mati and I were not, we, we didn't hide, we didn't lie, and we didn't, you know? Um, and there is, there's a lot of shame that is connected to it. Um, and you know, fears and shame and all these emotions, if they're, the, the, if they're kept hidden, they just grow more of them. They don't just disappear if you ignore the problem. They'll just continue to manifest and grow. Um, and that's, you know, with, with talking about these topics and all these different organizations that are speaking up about addiction and, you know, the, and, and the collateral damage, it's so important because there's so many, unfortunately, you know, men and women and teenagers and children that are so exposed that there needs to be more talk about it. There needs to be this, this realization that it exists, that acceptance that it exists, and that there is something you could do about it. There are choices you can make in your life, which is a whole topic of my mic drop and the whole purpose of my life. You know, even with my center of my soul, it's a choice that I've made in my life. Can you sum that up for me again in terms of the, the whole purpose of your life in one sentence? Of, 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 of of the choices that I've made, of the actions that I'm making every day, of the willingness to do them and to and to prey on them, you knowing that I'm also not a I'm not I'm, I might be a single mother and I might have all these these things, but that doesn't define who I am. I still have a support system. I still have people in my life that I've I've brought them into my life, you know, because you can't go through it alone. You know, even when it, we were talking, you know, I, I know both Rabbi Jacobson, I think everyone mentioned, you know, about having a, that third person there, even in your marriage, you know, just having that other person there. I'm not alone in any of this. You're not alone in any of this. Anyone who's listening to, to, to this webinar, you know, each one of us who are here speaking and sharing is reassurance that we're here for you. And there are other people who are here for you. And it takes a lot of courage to sign up to the webinar. And it takes a lot of courage to speak up. And not everybody's meant to speak up, you know, with a megaphone, but just speaking up and sharing, it gives that release, it gives that healing, that honesty that you're willing to have with yourself to go through the process and to go through the healing and to the change. And those are all choices that a person makes in their life. Thank you, Stephanie. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to share some final thoughts um, in brief, a minute or two. 
not only me, I'm saying for, for us to just go around final thoughts to someone who's dealing with this and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. So Miriam, if you want to go first and Stephanie, Rabbi Jacobson. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Ellie, for putting this together. Thank you. Uh, 26 Israel, years ago, or, 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 or 2007, I did not think that this is going to happen ever to me. Um, and to be in a panel of uh, the distinguished rabbi, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, and of course, Stephanie, you're amazing. I'm honored. I'm honored that our, our, our souls are connected here for this purpose and, and to, God willing, bring a correction in, in, in to, to the world. And most importantly, to bring more of God's light into anybody's home that they, uh, is suffering from the addiction. Um, in a few words, I'm very, I, I'm in total gratitude about what happened and a total curiosity what will happen and how more and more will things will morph and, and reveal to me. Because like Rabbi Simon Jacobson says, uh, from the concealment, under the concealment, uh, I want to, I'm, I'm anxious to see what is going to be revealed. And um, stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. Thank you. Stephanie, some final thoughts. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you for this platform. Um, and I've gained so much from everyone who shared. Um, with the book, The Choice by Dr. Edith Ager came out last year, and it has, she's my real life hero. I say Esther Hamalka from Miguel and Esther from the Perm story is my, you know, Tanakh hero, um, my biblical hero, but Dr. Edith Ager is my, uh, my, my real life hero. She's a Holocaust and survivor, right? She's a Holocaust survivor. And in her book, she I talks the about the process too. of what? I heard her on a podcast a little bit ago. So uh, unbelievable book, life transforming, life, life, life is a transformative book to read. And she talks about, you know, she talks about, the book is called The Choice. And she talks about victimhood and she talks about, you know, the, you know what route you could take or what route she could have taken. Um, and she goes into details and it's unbelievable. And she talks about how she uses her experience to, uh, of becoming through Dr. Viktor Frankl um, and being, you know, a student of, you know, of Dr. Viktor Frankl. Um, she uses her experience to not only become a doctor herself to heal others, but she finds healing along the way. So this whole experience for me over the last eight years and to this webinar at this exact moment has brought another level of healing. The mic drop, doing the mic drop brought a, an unbelievable level of healing that I didn't know it, I, 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 what was there, you know, what would still need to be touched on, you know, through, you know, 12 steps, through therapy after Mati died. But, you know, she talks about Dr. Viktor Frankl and there's one quote that is just, you know, sticking to me more and more. And this is also part of who I am and what I thrive, you know, every day for. And the quote is between stimulus and response, there is a space. In this space lies our choice. And in our choice lies our growth and our freedom. It's a yeah. lot, it's heavy, it's, it's, it's deep. But really, when you think about it, when it comes to you're, you're stuck with something there in front of you, you know, you have a choice to respond and how you're going to respond is, you know, how you're going to choose that response can make all the difference in life. And just because you make a certain response doesn't mean you have to keep making that one over and over again, that carousel of insanity that I talk about. You can make changes in your life. And in those changes, in that choice, your growth and your freedom are there there's so much that is that is something that has been so you know and I read it and, and I reread it and I, I have it all over in my mind it's just it's it's embedded in my heart now it's just in, in my actions and another one that I say all the time is by Maya Angelou when you know better you do better when you hear these stories when you hear when you hear the experiences of others and something's triggering you, it's triggering you for a reason. 
And then like, you know, Dr. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Jacobson said, there's some people on here that took courage just to show up to this webinar. And when you know better, you do better. And those actions, it, one action is going to lead to another action. Like I say, like one choice led to another choice in my mic drop. And then you realize that you, when you look back, and every year on Mati's yurt side, I look back and I reflect, I'm like I do on my birthday also. I look back and I reflect of like, how did I get here? And there's something, there, there's, there's something tangible, even though it's not like, you know, a pen, but there's something emotionally, mentally, spiritually tangible that exists in my life now that didn't for a long time. So those are my final uh, thoughts. Thank you, Stephanie. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining today and thank you for your courage to share your story and to share it again and to thank you. Uh, take us on the journey with it as it's growing and progressing. And that question I asked earlier about the happy ending, I'm glad I did because your answer was, was spot on. You're on that road and you're yeah. on that journey with us. And I think that it's often in some ways more challenging to, I did not do that. I shared, I've always shared when I felt like I got to a place of some clarity of some outward resolution. You know, I had a few years ago where I went through a very, very difficult period in business and losing a lot of money. And during it, I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't talk about it to anyone. anyone. I was um, existentially embarrassed. It was crushing for me, crushing for my identity. And as I've um, seen, seen that period pass and now it's somewhat in the rear view mirror, it's easier for me to talk about it. So I commend your willingness to to take us on the journey um, while it's going on, both in the mic drop and again today and the other work that you're doing. Rabbi Simon, you want to take us out? <laughs> sure. I, I literally sitting here in somewhat uh, tears, and not to the pain actually, I just am so taken when I see uh, people bearing their souls, you know, this uh, genuine, and sincere journey. It just t teaches us what the real, I mentioned the word dignity a few times, the dignity of your journey. So I, number one, I'm totally humbled and honored. Miriam, Stephanie, Ellie, to be here with you and all those that are listening or watching. Two things that I wanna share briefly that come to mind in a way that maybe sums it up. A number of years ago, just, just came to mind as, we, as I was listening. A number of years ago, I was counseling a couple that were in the throes, yeah, very difficult. One of them was, the, in this case, the man was the addict and his spouse, and they were dealing with the horrible stuff, lies, deception. I mean, it was uh, probably the worst case scenario because none of them were willing to judge, but he was not willing to budge. He was, the, he was still lying, but she convinced him I guess it was an ultimatum that at least come speak with me. They both did respect me because they had known me for, for a number of years. And it didn't take long for me to realize that she was trapped and psychologically basically hypnotized by the fact he was very manipulative, very narcissistic, and he convinced her she has no other options. He was her only option and things are just gonna stay this way and she just has to accept it. And he had all these, he was excellent, gift of gab, the charm. He was able to turn it on and all of that. And I recognized that. And I recognized she wasn't ready to hear uh, another perspective. She was that just desperate. But I remember this. I, I dug deep into my own heart and soul and I said to her and him, I said, you know, God created every human being with enormous potential and a and tremendous amount of beauty. I ask you both, do you think you're living up to the most beautiful parts that you're capable of. The things you always dreamt about when you were young. And I just wanted to rattle actually, her especially, him too, but especially her, just to wake up something of a dream that she may have once had that she gave up on. Because she capably gave up on her possibilities. And I have to tell you, it didn't happen overnight. Plenty more problems, it got worse before it got better. But she called me about a year ago and she told me, I never forget what you said because it left me. I was haunted. I couldn't sleep nights. Am I living up to the most beautiful part of me? And I realized I gave up completely. I don't even know what beautiful meant anymore. My story, my narrative was my husband's narrative. It wasn't mine. I was just there as a prop to satisfy. And I was just in that survival mode 
Um, Stephanie put it well, martyrdom, the martyr, the Jewish mother, the, we had children, the wife, etc. I said, I have to thank you because I didn't hear you completely, but it planted a seed. And I want to say this to each one of us. You have tremendous beauty inside of you. You were born with it. I remember I once heard a line. You were born an original. Don't become a copy. You were born beautiful. Don't become contaminated by other people's narratives and stories. And finally, I will say Michelangelo, the great sculptor, once was asked, how do you carve those beautiful angels in the marble? Listen to this answer. Unbelievable answer. He said, I see the angel trapped in the marble, and I carved and carved and set her free. In other words, the beauty is there. The angel is there. You are that beauty. You are that angel. You are that music. You are that flower. And unfortunately, life sometimes we get trapped in marble or in concrete or in other substances. But the beauty is there for you to release it. You're a bird that can soar as high as you want to soar. And follow some of the beautiful suggestions here, powerful suggestions, but there's the choices we make. I personally believe that being here is divine providence. There's something said, we don't know who said it and what, when it was said and how it was said that can spark that beauty and go on that glorious journey. Sometimes it goes through difficult patches and difficult legs of the journey, but it's a tremendous journey. And it's an honor to be part of this. This is where reality really meets mankind, where we're honest. Sometimes, as I always put it, I say the honest, the ugly honesty is better than a false truth. And then you really reach places that are unprecedented. And God bless everyone. With the strength of God and the strength of the spirit that God gave us, we can achieve the impossible even. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi yeah. Jacobson. Thank you for your courage to uh, join these types of conversations and share and share your wisdom uh, with us. You know, when I think about the, the common denominator between the, the guests I, and the messages, I hear two, there are two words that stick out. One is gentle and one is courage, right? The courage to have these kind of conversations and to take on these topics. And then the other is this, there was a unifying theme of gentleness. I think that was beautiful through everyone, through the panelists today, where you know, some, someone in recovery heard him say that healing is meant to be worn like a, a loose garment, not like a straight jacket, right? It's those messages, and we'll always hear it, someone who's done a lot of work on themselves, and especially in recovery, it starts taking on a much more gentle tone. Those languages of being, we have to be hard on ourselves in order to get the results we want, that intensity almost always backfires. And while it sometimes works for a short period of time to get those short-term results, those with the staying power, I always notice it. You know, you look at the old timers in recovery, the people who are sporting 20, 30 years and who are not just sporting years of abstinence, but of emotional sobriety, there's a gentleness to their approach. And in talking about collateral damage, I was nervous because I was nervous that in trying to highlight the pain that addicts cause others, we could also lump guilt and shame on the addicts themselves for the collateral damage that they cause, right? It's not only what they do to themselves and not only the, the shame they often have and the beliefs they have about the, themselves. So I was nervous how to navigate that how to, because my, I feel like my role and my mission is to reduce shame, reduce shame so that people could ask that question, that first question for help. And today, today's webinar was not about practical solutions necessarily that someone can take, it's more about that first step that first step of reaching out to someone, a friend and having a conversation, the first step of going to a meeting, the first step of asking for help, the first step of maybe even not talking to someone, just writing it in a journal and putting the words on paper for the first time and saying, this is what's going on. And I saw one question that came in or one statement that came in that really moved me today. And I felt like that this, this panel was worthwhile just for, um, just for that. Someone said, I realized that I've been in uh, like holding on to something for the last seven years, my relationship. And just that realization, and maybe that person is not ready yet to ask for help. But putting those words out there in the universe becomes that, that first step of it. And I'm, I'm grateful for the, uh, for the others in the panel. The, gentle, the, the gentleness and the courage of this conversation. I feel a little bit more full from it. This was a spiritual ritual for me. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. Thank you, Miriam, for joining late. Thank you. In Israel, thank you, Stephanie, for your 
um, for your story, your beautiful story, and for your words, and Robert Jacobson for for uh, for joining. You know, these webinars just started as a these series started as a conversation with you, and I'm glad to bring you back in and see her again. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you.